you guys like to shout the praises of God?
focus on you, O King of Kings. the men are at the men's encounter this weekend. Yeah. Come on, ladies, our weekend is next. Come on. But I was talking to my husband this morning, and he was saying there's so much breakthrough here. There's so much freedom and healing here. And as we go into this next song, I want you guys, I want you guys to see your breakthrough. I want you to see your healing. How many of you guys know God has never failed? He's never given up on us. Even if we failed, he never failed. Sometimes we mirror our God to us, but we're actually supposed to be mirrored to him, amen? amen. And he never fails. He never gives up on us. And so as we sing this song, I want you guys to know that he is for you. He is for you. He is for you. And he tears down any wall that we put up just to get to us.
Still in your 
We're going to walk in dominion like never before. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for tearing down the walls, for breaking down the barriers, for seeing past any failure, weakness, or inadequacy. Lord, and I thank you for the power of your blood that is more than enough for us. In Jesus' name. You're enough. Take me back. 
Declare it over your life today. thank you for who you are, to thank you for who you are, Lord Jesus. We acknowledge, Lord, that nothing else in our life, Lord, nothing else but your presence, Lord, is what we need in Jesus' name. Pastor Bethany mentioned earlier, we have about 70 men up in Payson. Woo! <laughs> we have about 70 men just worshiping their hearts out in Payson right now, and um, awesome things are happening there. Did we lose? No, we did not. Uh, if, uh, if it looks a little female dominant in here, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> but next week, it's going to be a little male dominant in here because us women are going to take our turn up on the mountain. Woo! So we're super excited for that. And um, so I just want to share um, uh, offering this morning as we take our offerings, um, just share a little testimony of my own. Um, I think after years and years of serving God, you kind of get in the groove of um, tithing and, and you kind of almost don't think about it anymore. Um, until something crashes. <laughs> and so uh, um, we all know 2020 uh, wreaked havoc on, every, havoc on everyone. And um, so we were cruising along pretty good. And uh, um, out of uh, about 2021, um, COVID hit my family. <laughs> and I ended up in the hospital for a couple of weeks. 
Um, but prior to that, I had given my notice at work. Um, a job I had had for 13 years was faithful, loyal, stable, and it was kind of a uh, kind of a new direction I was going in. I was looking forward to, but with all of the COVID stuff, it was changing the atmosphere in the workplaces and what people were doing virtually, and you know the hiring processes and all that. So this job kept getting pushed forward. Um, okay, we're going to start training in this month, and it would get pushed forward again. Well, the job I was working was pretty faithful and stable, so um, they were willing to keep me as long as I was willing to stay. So it was kind of a good, you know, trade-off there. I was training people and, you know, getting prepared to leave, and I still hadn't gotten to train the main person that was going to take over my job um, when suddenly I got COVID so bad, like I said, I was in the hospital, and um, I was in there for a couple of weeks, and, well, since I had already given my notice months before, and was kind of on a see as we go thing. Um, they kind of had to move on, <laughs> and I, you know, I didn't blame them at all. But um, I got out of the hospital. I was at home on oxygen and trying to recover. But I had no job anymore. And for the first time in 13 years, I had no job. So it was a strange place, um, you know, in every way. And for a long, well, for a while, we were cruising along because we were pretty financially stable. But then all of a sudden, you know, you start to feel, um, you know, when it starts going the other direction. And so we were, we were praying together every morning and just asking God for direction. And it took a little bit longer than I was expecting <laughs> for the next job to come. Um, but it did come. And, um, and so it, it, you know, it was a, it was a time of faith, but I was reading in Genesis a couple of days ago and I was thinking about, um, this situation as I was reading, um, how it went down for Jacob, because Jacob, um, he was given a big promise, as we all know, um, for, and he had all kinds of promises over his life, and he was working for his uncle Laban, and um, everything he put his hand to prospered, and it prospered very well, but it was prospering for his uncle Laban and not himself personally for a long time. For about 20 years, he served, and, and Laban didn't want to let him go because everything he did, he knew God was prospering him because of Jacob. Um, but I felt encouraged by that when I read it because eventually um, God didn't allow him to be cheated and um, he was able to obtain all the, all the flocks and all the herds and God gave him favor and all of that. But um, I, I was thinking about the 20-year process because sometimes we're kind of waiting for this overnight miracle to happen and, um, and we're, we get impatient in the wait. Um, but God honors our faithfulness, and he honored Jacob's faithfulness. He did not allow him to get cheated, but he had to work, and he had to be faithful, and he just knew that God was going to take care of him, and um, he, you know, he didn't stop working just because he didn't see something happen in the moment, and so if you're sitting in that place right now, I just want to encourage you. Keep your faithfulness. Hang on tight. God has not forgotten you, and, um, and uh, just hold fast. So I uh, just wanted to encourage you that if our ushers would come, I would just like to uh, bless the offering. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I love you so, so much. And I thank you for your faithfulness in my life. And uh, I just pray for your complete blessing over this offering. And I pray that you encourage the hearts of everyone, Lord, no matter where their stage is in the tithing game, Lord, encourage their hearts and give them the courage to start, um, to start something new. Um, or to continue on wherever they're at, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, and our band left us. <laughs> so at this moment, at the will we just play something? Well, just kidding. Instead, I'm just going to introduce. <laughs> we have a guest speaker in the house. <laughs> Coming from CFTN Chandler, yes? Central. I'm sorry, I said Chandler. It just rolls off the tongue. Coming from CFTN Chandler. Uh, CFC, it just comes right off the tongue. CFTN Central <laughs> is Pastor George Chadwick. Hey. 
Good morning. All right. Hey, we need a little bit more of that applause. Come on now. No, just kidding. Just kidding. This is going to be like a smorgasbord sermon. Look at that. Beautiful. Good to be with you guys. Chrissy, uh, please say hi to my beautiful wife, Chrissy. We've been married 35 years. Three kids, adults, three adult children. And a brand new first time grandbaby. <laughs> Penny Pooh is five and, a half, five and a half months old. And uh, we're living the dream right now. We've always been told that having grandbabies is the best thing ever. And it's actually true. <laughs> Just because you realize, like, gosh, this is like, it feels like our baby. But we had absolutely zero pain involved in producing her. <laughs> or stress or pressure, and now we just have fun with the, it's like our baby. Come on now, who's got a grandbaby in this place, anybody? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your warm welcome, and Chrissy and I are really privileged to be here with you. I want to send Pastor Mike and Mary Maiden's love. They love you guys and love what Pastor Cal and Bethany are doing here at uh, CFTN Chandler. God is moving. It's a good day to be alive. Aren't you glad your heart's beating and you're sucking in some oxygen this morning? Hey, wouldn't you? I wouldn't want to be alive any other day than today. Man, it's exciting times. God is moving. The kingdom of God is alive. The devil is defeated. And we have everything we need to make a mark on this generation. I don't care how old you are, I don't care how young you are, if you're breathing and if you're alive, you're a part of this generation, and your life matters, and your story counts. Amen. Yes, so I did bring a copy of my book. I released uh, my book, The Glorious Exchange, Finding Your Place in the Presence of God, about the same week as the pandemic hit. It's great timing. And... Um, this book is, really comes out of my, uh, my story as a worship leader. I've been a worship leader for 25 years. I actually followed up Israel Houghton. You know, everybody know Israel? Yeah. He was the worship, uh, had a start in worship leading at Eagle's Nest, which was Pastor Mike Maiden's first church in Scottsdale back in the 1990s. And uh, the day he left, I took over, and that's the day that kind of this brutal scandal rocked the church and rocked Pastor Mike's world. I don't know if you have known, know the story or not, but it's, it's in a book that he's written. And um, so I, I'm proud to say I took the church from like 3,000 people down to 150 in five years of worship leading. <laughs> Beautiful. What a wonderful time. And so, um, but that was quite a day following up the funk master himself, Israel Houghton, with 3,000 people looking at you saying, what do you got, brother? And I don't have what he has. But uh, anyway, 25 years of leading worship, so I've written a book about the presence of God. The first, this, it's broken into three parts. The first part is called The Power of Music, and so we talk about the power of music. And, uh, you know, the, the euphoria that we feel in music at times is an interesting thing because is it possible that there could be that kind of euphoria for something that does not exist in its fullness somewhere else. And we know that when we get into the presence of God in our eternity, we're going to be so infused with the presence and beauty of God and the sound of music. You know, when people, uh, some people have died and gone to heaven and come back, they say one of the things they mention is the sound in heaven. It's the sound of music. Multiple millions of angels singing. Harmonies, melodies, cross harmonies and melodies. And our voices lifted up with them. This is going to be the essence of heaven, essence of eternity. And I believe we catch just a glimpse of it when we hear the beautiful sound of music at times. The second part of the book is called The Power, is, is the power of His Presence. And so we talk about His presence and how it affects our life. And then the third part of the book is The Power of Your Choice which is actually the most significant piece of the whole thing, your choice to enter into his presence. So I actually sold all my copies last week. I was at uh, CFTN in Surprise, and um, 
So you'll have to go to Amazon if you want to pick up a copy of this book, The Glorious Exchange. Teresa, would you like this copy? Nice catch. Well, we're really excited and honored to be here, and uh, this morning I'm going to talk about the secret place. Everybody say the secret place. Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 says this, Jesus talking. This is, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, the first sermon recorded in the Gospels that Jesus spoke. You'll find it in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, three full chapters of a sermon. And so at this point in the sermon, Jesus says this, But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you've shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. He said, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. Where is he? He's in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And many times we, we think of people who have a powerful ministry in God and we think, gosh, I want that. But it's interesting to see that God is interested in the secret place, not the public place. He's interested in what happens in your secret life with him. And then he promises that what he sees in secret, he will reward openly. And it gives us a clue into what is important to God, what is the priority for him, and the priority is always our relationship with him. And so we want to just dig into this a little bit this morning. It's a difficult thing to talk about because the secret place in our life is so personal, and it's actually so difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to build a secret place with God. It's, it calls on you to, to speak to him when there's, there's no help involved. There's no one whispering sweet nothings in your ear except for the Holy Spirit. There's no one like your worship leaders not coming to your house to, to lead you in worship. It's actually up to us to build that relationship with God. It's up to us to build that place in him. And it's a difficult thing. Jesus goes on to say in the Sermon on the Mount, the next chapter over, chapter 7, Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he says, enter by the narrow gate uh, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Everybody say, I'm one of the few. <laughs> and there's nothing easy about following God. Especially in a day like today, it's not an easy thing. There's a lot of resistance. There's the enemy of God working against us. There's life itself that's filled with uh, difficulties and, and uh, pressure and, and feelings like we're alone. But the difficulties do not indicate that God has left us. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate for, for the gate that we go into his presence is not wide, it's narrow, and the way is difficult. But the power of that choice to go into the presence of God in those moments will reward your life deeply. And so my, my whole intent this morning is to encourage us in our secret place. I want to encourage you that your secret place matters. That your time with God matters. That he's with you. That he's listening that he cares, that his heart is there for you. There's nothing easy about following God. We associate God with comfort and the devil with disruption, but most of the time it's the opposite. The devil wants to keep us comfortable, and the Holy Spirit is leading into situations that disrupt our status quo. Jesus set the ex ultimate example of this if you remember, when he came out of the waters of baptism, what's the first thing that happened? The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It wasn't a bed of roses. He was led into difficulty. He was led into temptation. He was led into a 40 days of fasting, no food. He came to the point where, I mean, he got hungry. And the devil began to tempt him. 
And so I believe that Jesus is the perfect example of walking through the narrow gate and living through the difficult path into all that God has given him. Can we expect any different? And so the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness for 40 days. And then the first sermon that Jesus preached, if you remember, the, the crowd tried to throw him off the cliff. And so even in his first sermon, he was like fighting this resistance among the people that he was trying to help. And the Bible just says he just walked through them. They couldn't lay a hand on him. It wasn't his time. Nobody takes Jesus' life. He gives his life. Come on, Jesus. He is the Lord of all. He's the King of kings. He's the great, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God. He's everything we need, and we need to be spending our time with him. He was surrounded by crowds of people every day, expecting and sometimes demanding miracles, lepers, wanting to be touched, demon-possessed people needing to be set free, paralytics being healed. He, everywhere he went, there was a throng of people demanding and expecting things from him. That is not an easy life. And Jesus gave, the Bible is so cool because it says he only did what he heard his father tell him to do. So he had perfect obedience. And, and I really personally believe that the, the longer we walk with God, the more we, we minister, the more we step into our callings, the gate that we need to go through becomes narrower and narrower. And the, and the path that we have to take becomes more difficult, not easier, as we go with God because it, it becomes so specific for what he wants to do in our life. And so we don't need to be afraid of these things. We just need to trust God. Even to the point where Jesus went into the garden, the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember when he was actually saying to God, let this cup pass from me. Do I have to do this thing? And he felt the pressure and the resistance so powerfully against him that he was actually sweating blood. Peter, James, and John, come on and pray with me. And they just keep falling asleep. But he keeps praying, Jesus, and he's praying drops of blood. And he's saying, Father, can you take this cup from me? And finally, after realizing that it's not going to go away, he said, Lord, okay, not my will, but your will be done. It's the narrow gate and the difficult path. That's some good news this morning, isn't it? <laughs> That's a trick question. It's actually hard news, but it's so important for us to see because I believe part of this journey is that our time with God is resisted from the enemy. Our time with God is resisted by life. Here I am talking about the secret place in God, and you would almost think that, well, he must have a perfect secret place with God. I don't have a perfect secret place with God, but I sure am working on it. I'm building one. I'm understanding the value of it. I'm understanding that my voice matters to him. And so the secret place that we build with God is really critical for our life. And as we grow in our relationship with God, I do believe that the way will become more narrow and will, in effect, squeeze us into his purpose and destiny for our lives. Jesus maintained a healthy secret place with God. We see it all through the Gospels. He would go off by himself to pray. Many times it's recorded after, after working extremely difficult days, doing God's will, doing everything he heard the Father, he, he would just be gone. Where did Jesus go? And he's off by himself, praying to God, building a secret place, spending time with God. If Jesus did it, we need to do it for sure. And therefore, it's vital that we build and maintain a powerful secret place with God. We don't find our comfort from the world. We find our comfort in his presence. Marco Marantete. He was a friend of mine. In another life, I played baseball. So I played college baseball and then a couple years in the minor leagues with the Montreal Expos. Most of you have never heard of the Montreal Expos. It was actually a big league team. They became the Washington Nationals. But back in like 1922, I was playing baseball. <laughs> Come on now. And so a bunch of us, you know, were just first year playing in the minor leagues. I was in Calgary, Alberta, playing with the Montreal Expos rookie league team. And 25 guys are thrown onto this team together, onto this field. Not one of us know each other. And I remember the first day of practice, during batting practice, I was watching. I was out in left field, and I was watching this one guy on the team. He started over on the other side of the field, and he was making his way around the field, stopping at every other guy on the team and having a conversation with him. And I watched this, and I thought, what, what is he doing? And, and he came all the way around the field, and I was like the last guy, and he came walking to me, and I said, I wonder what he's talking about. And he came up to me, and he said, hey, do you know Jesus? And I went, what? Do you know Jesus? 
And I thought, man, that is bold. And I did know Jesus. It was actually in my heart. I wanted to minister to the team. I wanted to be an example. And it was like a ministry to me at that time. And I thought, man, this guy is so bold. Have you ever met somebody that's like a rocket and they go up and then they come crashing down? And I thought, man, I hope his boldness does not spoil the, the testimony of a life lived for Jesus. And I was thinking at that time, I need to b build respect with the guys on the team before I share Christ with them. And so I was watching as Marco's, Marco did this, and I thought, man, I hope he doesn't blow this thing. And then we turned out being roommates, and so for a couple of months, and Marco was the man. Man, he lived it out. He was solid as a rock. He was powerful. He was a witness for Jesus. Every guy on the team was being touched by his life, and I started to fall in love with this guy. Man, I thought, man, I love Marco. He was probably the worst pitcher I've ever seen in baseball. <laughs> he threw an 85-mile-an-hour. That's not real fast in the, in the professional baseball. 85-mile-an-hour fastball straight as an arrow right down the middle of the plate every time he threw the pitch. You know, it was like, man, Marco, come on. I'm out in the outfield. Please give me a break out here. I mean, have any, anybody heard of Cecil Fielder? Prince Fielder is his son. It tells you how long ago this was. Cecil Fielder was on one of the teams we played against. He was like a giant of a man, 18 years old. And Marco was pitching, and I was in center field, and Cecil hit this ball to center field. It's the hardest baseball I've ever seen hit. It was like never got more than 10 feet in the air. It was still rising as it went out of the ballpark in center field over my head. And when we came into the dugout, Marco was in there, and he goes, did you see that ball? When it went over my head, its arms and its legs were thrown back, and it was screaming, Wah! <laughs> That was Marco Marentete. And I loved him, and I thought one day I came to Marco, and I said, man, what's your secret, Marco? How do you have this strength in God? And he said, you know, really, the only way it's happened is with the day that I chose to spend time with God reading his word, and I read his Bible every day. And I thought, oh, my goodness, really? And he said, that's it. And I thought, that's, that's the whole, that's the strategy, that's the recipe, and that was it. And so at that point in my life, I began to Read my Bible every day. And you know, if you start to spend time with God, in a few months of time, you'll begin to feel a strength build in your heart. If you begin to read God's word on your own, you know, the most powerful revelation you'll ever receive out of God's word is the one you dig out yourself in his word. It's not the sermon you hear. It's God's word coming alive in your personal time with him in revelation touching your heart. It becomes something that will affect your life the rest of your life. And so I began to read my Bible every day like Marco. And I just felt the strength of God rising up in me. And I realized, man, this is the trick. This is the way we go. This is the way the kingdom of God is established in our life. By building a life with him that no one else can build for us. Your relationship with God is your relationship with God. It's no one else's. No one can build it for you. You can come to church and be encouraged, but nobody can build your time with God except you. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear your expression. He wants to hear how your heart beats. He wants to see what you think. He wants to hear your intimacy, what you're thinking inside, what you desire, what you want to see him do. He wants to hear these things from us. He's not interested in just putting everybody in a big bag. It's a personal relationship with God. And how do we build it? We build it one day at a time, one moment at a time with him in a secret place when nobody else is there, when nobody else is watching, but when we are just with him. It is not an easy thing to do, but I want to encourage you. We are those that go in the narrow gate. We take the difficult path, and we find out that God is for us and not against us. And nobody can take that away from us. If they didn't build it, they can't tear it down. But if you build your place with God, man, you got a good thing going. This is the goal of our life. This is the strength of our life, especially in a day like today. I don't think you have a chance unless you have a secret place with God in this generation. I think there's too much, too, too much resistance, too much demonic activity, too many things that the enemy is trying to perform in this day. We need to be the sons and daughters of God that rise up in this generation with strength. And we find that strength in our secret place with God. Amen. Amen. So check out these scriptures in Psalm the Psalms are just some great scriptures. 
Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Psalm 32, you are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Psalm 27, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Psalm 31, you shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of man. You shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. The secret place that you build with God will be unique because you are unique. Nobody has a voice like you. There's 8 billion people on the earth right now. Not two of them are the same. You could look even in this room. Every single person in this room is utterly different. I believe this is the joy of God. Building a relationship with each of us personally and hearing the unique expression of each life. Come on now, this is where it's all about. This is what it's all about in Jesus is finding this place with him. Amen. Building your, your secret place with God. So what I wanted to do this morning is just look at a f- three different encounters in the life of Moses that I believe demonstrate the different kinds of ways that we meet God. And so Moses is like a type, a shadow of of God's kingdom in the Old Testament, that when we read the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, through Jesus, it comes alive with meaning. So Moses' experiences with God are a great example for us. The first one is that the burning bush. Remember, he's just minding his own business in the, in the desert, watching his father-in-law's sheep. Who knows what he's doing? I personally don't believe he was thinking about God or praying or doing anything. I think he was just watching the sheep, wondering what's going on with my life when he looks up and sees this bush burning, and he starts to go towards it because it's not being destroyed. It's not being consumed by the fire. And as he approaches the burning bush, a voice comes out of the bush and says, Moses, stop right there. Take your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. It's the voice of the Lord. This is at the burning bush where Moses received his calling from God. God said, I need you to lead my people Israel out of Egypt. And so Moses, understandably, is shocked by this experience. It's it's a sovereign move of God in Moses' life. And I believe all of us get burning bushes. I believe you've had some burning bushes. The burning bushes in my life and I believe in your life are those times when God encounters you when you're not even thinking about him, when his presence just hits you, when you least expected it, and you realize, oh my goodness, he knows my name. There's a calling from God. He he has something for me. And so the burning bushes in our life are very significant moments in our life when we come to know that God knows us and that there's something there that he's real. That his presence is dynamic. And so the burning bushes in our life are extremely important. It's a sovereign move of God. He sovereignly has called you out. He said, come on, son. Come on, daughter. I have something for you. And so it's a a really powerful moment in our life, the burning bushes in our life. The second kind of encounters that that Moses had with God was on the mountaintop. Remember Mount Sinai when God came down. And, And the Bible describes Mount Sinai, the top of the mountain, like it's, it's shaking. It's got lightning and thunder happening. There's fire up there. There's smoke. There's a sound of a trumpet on the top of the mountain that's getting louder and louder. And all the people of Israel are looking up at that mountain saying, man, what is going on on top of the mountain? And out of the mountaintop, God shouts out to Moses and says, Moses, come on up. And incredibly, Moses goes up the top of the mountain with God. He spent 40 days and 40 nights on top of the mountain in that kind of presence, the manifest, absolute presence of God with all kinds of stuff shaking. And and so the, the, the mountaintop experiences with God, in my view, when I see this, I think about this. I think about our time coming together on the mountain when there's shaking going on, when there's smoke and, and lights and thunder and the subwoofers are pumping and people are, are like some people look like they're on fire. And it's very intimidating to think of going into the presence of God among people. But something happens to us when we go into the presence of God, unashamed. 
when we go in with, with no regret, when we go in and say, I'm here, Lord, and we join in his presence among other people. And so all of Israel is down at the base of the mountain, and their, their knees are shaking together saying, I'm not going up in that, and Moses is the only one who goes. When he comes down the mountain, his face is glowing. He's been so transformed by the presence of, his, of God that his face actually looks different. And when he comes down, it's interesting. This stuff is really cool to read in the book of Exodus. If you haven't read it recently, it's incredible stories. But when Moses comes down at, off the top of the mountain, what does he find? He finds Aaron, his right-hand man, has built an altar to an idol. And, and there's a golden calf, and all of Israel is bowing down to it. And so the indication is that when we go into the presence of God, our life is transformed in his goodness. We're helped. We're, we're given things that we need. We're told how we should live. We're corrected in some, at some cases. We're encouraged. We're filled with his strength in the presence of God. But when we don't go into his presence, we go the other way. And so Aaron did not get closer to God. He went farther from God. And they actually began, it's the most amazing line in the whole Bible, in my view. One of the most ridiculous things a, ma a human being has ever said. Moses said, where did this golden calf come from? And Aaron said, he said, well, everybody gave me their gold. I put it in the fire and out popped this calf. <laughs> it's like, really, Aaron? I personally think when he said that, he was looking around. Who just said that? That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and Moses throws the tablets down remember destroyed them and he goes back up the mountain gets a second copy of the tablets of stone that's what gets put in the ark of the covenant the tablets of stone i mean this stuff is so incredible when you read it in the old testament it's so rich with with uh, uh types and shadows and meanings and so the the top of the mountain is quite an experience with god and it's it comes by invitation so the burning bush is a sovereign move of god god just falls on our life he's in charge he's done it the top of the mountain, he comes down on top of the mountain, he says, come on up. He comes into a service, and he says, come and join it. Here, there's an invitation involved, and when we respond to that invitation, our life is changed. And it's really powerful. But there's a third kind of encounter that Moses had. And so look at the scripture in Exodus chapter 33, 9 through 11. It says, and it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. So check that scripture out again. It came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle, who went first, Moses, that the pillar of cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. So what would happen is Moses would go down the street in the encampment of Israel, and they had built a tent of meeting outside of the camp. And when Moses would go out to meet with God, all of Israel, the Bible says, would stick their heads out the, their tent door and watch as Moses would go down to meet with God. Moses would go into the tent of meeting, and then the cloud would come down and meet with him. In other words, man instigated it. We instigate the secret place with God. And so it goes on to say in the scripture, all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the, tent, at the tabernacle door. All the people rose and worshiped each man at his tent door. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. The first reason to build a consistent and intimate secret place with God is in the secret place you become the friend of God. In the secret place, in the tent of meeting, that's where we become the friend of God. I don't know about you, did you ever build forts when you were a kid? And we'd build forts in our room, we'd get sheets and hang them from the beds and We'd be build forts out in the woods, and we'd have our friends over. But, you know, I just remember being in the room with a fort made out of sheets. And there was something about the atmosphere in that tent. It just felt like you had to whisper. It felt like you had to, like, and some of the stuff we would say to each other, my friends and my brothers, should have been whispered. And, you know, it was like, this is like an intimate setting. There's something about building a tent, building a place that is meant to be just between you and just someone else, in this case with God, that creates an intimacy level that is priceless. Everything becomes more real, more honest, more intimate. There's something dynamic about creating a place that keeps the rest of the world out. It heightens the intensity of the things that we say 
And it, and it feels like you do have to whisper sometimes. You have to whisper your heart. And there's something about a secret place, creating a tent of meeting with God that elevates our relationship with God. That's what God wants to do with us. He wants us to have that place with him. The second reason to build a consistent and intimate secret place with God is that that is where we find out who he is and who we are. See, because the Bible is not a book of instruction. It's a book of identity. And when we dig into his word, we find out who we are and we find out who he is. It's like a love letter written from God to us. And that's the primary way he speaks to us through his word. The Bible is his communication to us. It's his voice. And then we also have the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting when we read that scripture about Moses being in the secret place that the Bible mentions that Joshua was also in there and that Joshua would stay after Moses left. And remember the first part of Joshua, the book of Joshua, that's when God tells a story of Israel coming into the promised land and Joshua leading them. Moses was not leading them. Joshua led them into the promised land. God, I believe, spoke in that tent to Joshua, Josh, be strong and courageous. Remember, he's told Josh several times, be strong and courageous. Joshua, be very strong and very courageous. About the third or fourth time, you're starting to wonder, what's going to happen that I need to, be, need to be so strong and courageous about? And there was some giants that needed to be slayed. And Joshua was the man for it. But he found his strength in the secret place with God when he found out who he was and he found out who God was. It empowered his life. The third reason that we need to find our secret place is that that is where you find your approval and the acceptance of God. Remember when Adam and Eve took a bite out of the apple, rejection and condemnation rushed into the broken heart of man like a flood. And now every single one of us is, are born into rejection, into insecurity, into condemnation. Everything that sin breeds is happening almost automatically in our heart, right? You don't have to do a whole lot. I remember as a five-year-old, I stole a little can of Kiwi shoe polish out of the store. I don't know why that happened. What came over me? I saw this shining can, and I put it in my pocket, and I got home. I thought, man, I'm like a theft. I'm a thief. I had no reason to take this thing. There's something in my heart that was broken. And so the cry of every single human being is to be accepted and approved. And you can see it today like never before. It is actually the plague of this generation on social media to find approval and acceptance from people we don't even know. If we don't find our acceptance and approval from God, we will need it from man. But if we find our acceptance and our approval from God, and we find it in that secret place because we built that relationship with him, we will not strive to find it from the people around us. This is what gives us freedom and strength and authority to do the will of God in our life. If you find the acceptance and approval of God, you won't need it from man. Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. And we have a bonus reason. Number four, your secret place with God is an incubator for courage. I think of David. Remember when he was by himself in the fields watching his father's sheep twice once a lion and the second time a bear stole one of his dad's sheep. And the Bible says that he killed the lion and the bear to save that sheep. First Samuel chapter 16, God is telling the prophet Samuel, hey, stop being upset about King Saul who failed. I've seen the king. And he was telling the prophet Samuel, basically, I saw a young man, his name is David, and he has the heart of a king. He saw him where? He saw him in his secret place. He saw David when David was around no one else, no people, but clearly he was finding the strength of God to the point where he would sacrifice his own life 
basically, for his father's sheep. And God saw it. And so when we build that place with God, it's like an incubator for courage. It's an incubator for the things that we need in this generation, for this season of time. We need to find the strength of God that everywhere we go, we can be a light for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can build the kingdom of God. We can have the authority of God in our life to fulfill the things that he's called us to do. It's found in the secret place. Amen. So the last slide I have is just a few things that I thought would be helpful, just some helpful hints on building a secret place. And if we could put that up, there we go, beautiful. So I think it's really important just to be consistent and disciplined. And so to talk about a secret place is kind of difficult to do because you don't want to ever put any kind of legalism or like a religious sort of demand on anybody. And that's not what this is. This is about a relationship with God covered completely and totally by grace. To me, when I miss a time with God in a particular day, I'm, I say to myself, oh, man, I'm sorry, Lord, I didn't get with you today. I can't wait for tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be beautiful because I'm going to spend some time with you on purpose. And, of course, we spend all day fellowshipping with the Holy Spirit. There was a period of time in my life when, when I realized that, gosh, the Holy Spirit's in me. I, can, I fellowship with him. I hear his voice. We talk. We talk about things. I don't need to have a separate time where I meet with God. The Holy Spirit's in me. And so I stopped having a, uh, like a quiet time or a time with God for like 10, 15 years of my life. Now I look back and then I realize, no, we need both things. We need to put a time aside where we put everything out of our life except God and we tune in to what he's doing. There's a discipline to that that is required, but it can't be by religious legalism. It's by grace and it, and it shows a, a tenacity, a holy tenacity to say nothing's going to keep me from being in the presence of God. That's where I'm going to find my strength. When we do that, and I believe when we become consistent with that, our life will go to new levels of authority and strength in every realm that we live in. So be consistent and disciplined, covered by grace. Create a worship list. Took me many years to realize, gosh, why, aren't I, why am I not putting on some worship? And finally, I started playing worship when I prayed, and it just helps you to get into the presence of God, and it's so easy today. There's so much incredible worship. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Hello. Yeah. I believe the gift of the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, is for our private place. It's for our secret place. I don't know about you. Prayer is hard for me. I run out 30 seconds in English. I'm done. All right, what now? I don't know what to pray about. But then if I start praying in the Holy Spirit, if I spend a little bit of time, if I stop being distracted by my thoughts because your brain's going to keep thinking as you pray in the Holy Spirit, I used to think, oh, I should pray about that when I had a thought. Finally, I realized I'm just not getting anywhere. I keep getting interrupted. And when I started to put my thoughts out and realized my brain's not stopping and just, and just leaned in and began to give some passion and strength to praying in the Holy Spirit, I realized I was in a war. And there began to be other languages would begin to flow, and, and, I realized, and then I realized there was a, like a crescendo and like a, like a release when I prayed in the Holy Spirit long enough. Then I found that there was a place where I, there was a release, and I, I knew something happened. I'm not sure what it was, but something broke. Something was broken through. Something happened in the spiritual realm that will affect my natural realm. And then after I prayed in the Holy Spirit with strength like that, with a little bit of sound, lifting my voice, a little bit of passion, then I began to pray in English with authority. Then I had things to pray for, and I would begin to declare and proclaim the kingdom of God over my family, the kingdom of God over my wife, the kingdom of God over ministry, the kingdom of God over my community. And I would pray with authority because the Holy Spirit, he builds us up when we pray in the Holy Spirit. And our prayer becomes enlivened and, and filled with the goodness and the greatness of God. So pray in the Holy Spirit in your secret place. Come on, most of the time we're praying all wrong when we don't bring him in. Fourth, be authentic and transparent in your prayer. Kick out any religious language. Speak from your heart to your Father in heaven. So important just to speak honestly and to be vulnerable and honest to God. And then lastly, don't rush when you read your Bible. I know the first, the uh, reading the Bible in a year is like a thing, but to me it's like, I can't handle it. It's way too much information, way too much reading of the Bible. I can't read that much and retain anything. I like to go nice and slow when something strikes me, when it hits me in the heart, 
stop, read it again, put it in my heart. God's speaking. His word is speaking to us. And so don't rush. My advice is don't rush when you read your Bible. Don't, you don't have to read. It's not how much you read. It's the consistency and what you pull out of it that matters. Amen. Secret place. Let's stand to our feet together. I hope this has been encouraging for you. I'm trying to encourage us. I'm trying to encourage myself in, in this really important dynamic of our life with God. Pastor Bethany, I just believe that God has, is doing some wonderful things in you. And um, as I was praying for CFTN Chandler and praying for Pastor Cal and Pastor Beth, Bethany, I just felt God was speaking this, that, that there's a treasure chest in your heart. And that treasure chest, it's a, I, I saw it actually like floating down in the sea. Like sometimes you see a treasure chest at the bottom of the sea, and that sea is like, it's a picture of what you have built with God. And that there's a treasure chest, and as you open that treasure chest, I, I just saw the value, like the gold, the the gems, the, the beauty of God as he was releasing the things out of your life. And, and I know that there's been much resistance and much uh, many things that you've had to carry, but the Lord is saying, daughter, rise up in this day, for out of you I will cause gold to flow and gems to flow, and the words that you speak are filled with grace and power and effectiveness, and God is using you in this day to bring life and help to many. And even as many have felt the walls closing in, God is going to use you as one to bring in the deliverance and breakthrough needed. And so stand strong, young lady, and know that my hand is upon you, and I've given you a word to speak and a word to sing, and I've caused you to be filled with the wisdom of God. So rise up in this day with the strength and grace of God, and even those that have risen, risen up against you. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke everything that the enemy has tried to do. I rebuke every fear and anxiety. I, re I rebuke every resistance in the name of Jesus, and I say the power of God is flowing like a river in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Let's lift our hands to heaven. Just begin to worship God in this place. He loves you. He's called you. If you've been uh, feeling that kind of pressure in your life, like I just had this picture that walls, feeling like walls are closing in. If that's you, just slip your hand to heaven so I can see you you feel like that's something that's going on in your life like there's there's just so much resistance like you feel like it's almost hard to breathe I believe God is going to help you today it's so nice to know that he's for us that he's not against us that he's given us what we need that he's he's breaking through for us so, Father, I just pray right now, every single life that has felt closed in, that have felt the walls closing in on them, we thank you that there's a release today in Jesus' name. We, we say freedom in Jesus' name. Let the grace of God flow in Jesus' name. Let the, let the, let the beautiful and the powerful name of Jesus make a way and break through these walls in the name of Jesus. Let the walls come tumbling down in Jesus' name by the power of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Do we have some a prayer team that can come up and pray for folks? Yeah. So if anybody would uh, desire prayer, come on up and we'll pray for you. And um, so grateful for this chance to be with you this morning. God is good. Let's worship a little bit. And if you would like prayer, come on up and we'll pray for you. Amen. I just want you, nothing else, no nothing else.